Welcome to the Church Collective Podcast. In this episode, myself and Chris had the opportunity to talk to Josh and Jario from Saddleback Worship. Yep, that Saddleback. It was an incredible conversation just hearing about their new album. Awesome to talk to them about how they actually managed to do 20 or so campuses, and I think you're going to really enjoy this. So here we go with the Church Collective Podcast. Yeah, so Jario and I get to serve with Saddleback Worship and our our global worship pastor, John Cassetto. Um, in this season, we've our church as a whole has been kind of leaning into um, what it, what does it mean to grow in prayer culture and okay. and in our in our worship culture, and so like in this current season, what's been really special is to just see what the Lord is doing in those spaces. Like we have a prayer meeting every week, and we have you know the times of worship at our weekend services. It feels like new and fresh wind blowing through mm -hmm. our church, That's and awesome. so with that comes new songs like i feel like anytime the lord starts mm -hmm. to send new wind oftentimes like new melodies and new lyrics start to come that are tethered to the vision of of the house in the church and jario can speak into that too but like i don't know don't you think like the last 18 months we had a big pastoral transition this little pastor named rick warren uh mm -hmm. passed the baton to andy and stacy wood and it's just building off of all the things God has been doing through Saddleback Church, and we find ourselves in a really sweet season. Yeah, yeah. and I think um, it's it's been really sweet to see the change in many different areas, and just when we look back and see how many good things have come out of this church, and we love this church, and just understanding that the Lord's always doing something new. And with Andy's um, leadership, there was an emphasis of Jesus being the hero of the story. Mm. He's always been the hero. He will continue to be the hero. Um, and in his um, teaching to us, the worship leaders, worship teams at Saddleback, he's um, just been emphasizing how important it is to keep him in the center mm. of our songs and our worship. And I remember even having conversations with Josh um, maybe a, a couple of years ago, dreaming about what the future of Saddleback worship was. And I always, I used to tell him, we need to make music that we sing at church. We need to record yeah. something at our church. So I think that was yeah. part of the dream of this new yeah. album. Yeah, it's actually the first live album we've ever done. Wow. Um, and so just capturing the sound of our church and the people of our church, it's been really special. Yeah. Yeah. Would I'd love to hear, I'm sure someone, a bunch of people that are listening are resonating with the idea of like, we have to write music for our churches, uh, in our churches. So can you maybe speak to how did that get going? What was that culture like? Like you said, this is the first live recording. So what, what kind of stirred to move you guys into putting this together in a way and, and in the midst of it, keeping it pointed at your church versus we got to make an album yeah. and then distribute it everywhere. Cause that's always kind of where things end up going, but how do you, how do you stay grounded? Kind of what, what advice would you give that local worship leader? Yeah. I love that. I think Jarl mentioned it, but when Andy, so our, our goal is always to be tethered to our lead pastor. What is, what is our lead pastor saying? What's coming out of the sermons? What's the vision? And we never want to go ahead and we also don't want to be too far behind. We kind of want to be in lockstep with what the Spirit is saying to yeah. our lead pastor. And I remember, you know, because we have 20 campuses, just to give some context, we have 20 campuses. And so we want every campus to be unified in, in saying, these are the words, these are the melodies that God is giving our house collectively. Mm -hmm. And when Andy said, you know, we want G Jesus is going to be the hero of the Saddleback story. Songs of surrender started to be written because we really believe that we were entering a season where we were going to put it on the altar as a church, as a as as our church. We're going to say we're surrendering our preferences and our maybe personal goals, and we're just going to give it to you, Lord, and see what you do when we surrender all to you. And so that was the theme of this project is saying, Lord, you can do way more with our surrender than you can do with our selfish ambition or, cause we can do, you know, 
at churches as ministers, we can do a lot on our own mm. strength. Like we're in positions because we have a, we have talent and we have skill, but at the end of the day, the Lord really blesses and puts his favor on something that's surrendered to him and what he wants to do through that church and for that church. And I feel like albums are always markers for churches. I don't, yeah. I don't, I think churches release albums to mark the season they're in. And this one was no different. We just want to be surrendered to the Lord and saying, we're yours, Lord. We have open hands to do whatever you want to do. Yeah. And in the, in the process of doing that and writing these songs, we just actually started, started singing the songs at all the campuses before the songs were released, before the recording yeah. happened. We just started opening these declarations of faith, of, of surrender, um, just to see if they resonated with our people yeah. and us. And we realized that they did. Yeah. And it was really encouraging to see what the Lord was doing through these songs, putting in the lips of our people. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. Like you've said multiple times, like the music that's pointed towards Jesus. And that's a modern criticism often of worship music is it tends to be very me centric. Um, I mean, there's a, I mean, maybe not a modern criticism has been going on since hymns, right? Like there, there's always like, Oh, this yeah. is too much about me and not enough of, about Jesus. Mm. Speak, speak to that tension. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question that I think we're still wrestling with. Mm. Right. Like I, I think, before we be like after we re, after we captured the album, we have still been on this journey of like what's the ratio between like songs uh, that have me language and and what I've called throne room songs or songs that are like you're holy Lord you're worthy um, so songs about uh, the cross resurrection and return like what's the ratio between all the songs and I think. It's hard. I don't. I don't really have a, a like a, a for sure answer. I know the Psalms have a lot of verbiage around me, like Lord, I'm in despair. Like rescue me. Like there's a lot of that language in the Psalms. But I do find it that something shifts in the room when a a bulk of our songs are centered around this is who the Lord is. Vertical song straight to Him. Like the room shifts because the the attention becomes on the Lord. And we've been saying recently, our, our worship pastor and and Pastor Andy has has been saying the first step in our worship leading is to bless the Lord. Mm -hmm. Like that's our first and primary goal is to bless the Lord, and out of the overflow of that, people will be ministered to. Yeah, and I think understanding that different songs have different purposes. I'm a, I, I'm a firm believer that the assembly of the people is for the purpose of worshiping God. We focus on the Lord and from that blessings flow. Um, but you know, there's, there's other songs that might have more of a me language. And those are the songs that maybe awaken the faith in the people or even, um, the, the songs that declare our need of him because of my condition right now, you know, that kind of songs. Um, and the Lord can and will use anything. Yeah. I also believe that, you know? So if a, if a whole room is singing a song that's not, this, let's say it's a me song, but then faith arises from that, the Lord the Lord will use it. He, yeah. That's what he wants from us, you know? Right. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I mean, so, and, and, sorry, and some, some of those me songs might be good for like the drive to drop your kids off at school. And like your devotional time, and then maybe you you don't put that in your weekend set. Maybe the weekend set has a a bigger bulk of like declar declaration yeah. songs or yeah. vertical songs. But yeah, yeah. And when great. you see even in Revelations, when you see the throne room and what the elders and the angels are singing, and even um, the the jars filled with the oil that is the prayers of the people. You know, it's all of it is about the Lamb the one that is worthy to break the seals. And, you know, so even when Jesus um, gave his his body, his life for us, he became the master, the priest, the ultimate sacrifice. And um, he gave us us all priesthood, right? So that means that every person 
in church, every Christian, everyone, everyone who said yes to him is supposed to bring their offering to the Lord because we don't depend on, I can't bring an offering for Josh and Josh can't bring an mm. offering for me. Yeah. Um, and the offering is only to the Lord. So I think that's why the focus on him yeah. from that, everything flows. Talk about the uh, like the timeline. Like, when did you decide you're gonna do a live album, and then what was pre production like? Just the the entire process for like, I guess to encourage other churches that may be thinking like they have no clue what goes into making an album. You know? Yeah, yeah, and it, it's I feel like every church will probably do it different because it's always you always have to think through like the rhythm of your church and especially at Saddleback. I don't know of a slow month at Saddleback. I mean, we're, we're doing stuff all year round, but basically from beginning is we, we, we're always typically writing. And then we also do what we call like writing retreats as team and bringing in collaborators along the way that, that help us along the way, like partners, um, people like Mitch Wong and, and um, Kyle Lee and, and Lucas and Evelyn Cortazio, different people who come alongside and say, hey, we want to help build Saddleback. Like we want to help give new language and and melodies for your church. And we spent several months writing. And then like Jariel said, we just identified, hey, these are the songs that need to be on the lips of our people. And maybe we introduce it at a staff meeting or a midweek service. Maybe we it, it, it then gets to a push where we want to lead on a weekend and we're just kind of testing songs to see which ones are resonating and which ones are going to push the vision forward. And then once we've decided, okay, these are the songs that we want to record. Then it's the hard part of deciding who's going to carry these songs, like mm -hmm. which worship leaders from our church need to carry these songs. And, that's always hard, right? Because there's so many people that can sing the songs, but just being prayerful in this season, which ones need to carry the songs. And then the producer, we have a, a producer on staff, Mike Coppolis. He's, he's thinking through, you know, production and texture and the arc of the album, just how many songs that you can clap to, how many mid-tempo uh, songs. We're also thinking about the arc language wise. How do we, What's the journey we want to bring people on? And then in pre-production, we've selected the band, we've selected the vocals, and we're ironing out parts. Guitar parts, they're getting in the room and they're figuring out, okay, what's electric guitar one playing? What's electric guitar two playing? Um, bass parts, drum parts. And we're actually, um, we have like a little makeshift studio space and we're recording all the parts to figure out which parts sound good together as a whole we're singing the songs together in rehearsal and then we recorded um i think it was june 15 um yeah. june 15 we invited our church family we packed out the worship center and we just sang the songs and the church came and sang so loud it was so beautiful so great that was yeah. like the highlight of the whole experience is seeing our church family sing the songs and immediately after that we just we just go into um listening to the the takes and starting the mixing process and and figuring out like what's the right mix for each song and then a lot, through the whole time and this was like a huge learning for us is i don't think it's ever too early to invite um people to the table that are good with like visuals just what's the story of the album like what are the visuals like the cover art is an altar in front of an infinity mirror and like people who have that eye like i don't know how they do it that they can just see things that i can't see um and it's kind of like that passage of scripture where like the different parts of the body coming together to to be the body of christ like they were at the table and there was they were just thinking like this is what we see this is how the visuals will pair with the audio and we just went through the mixing process and 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 get it mixed and mastered and and we released the whole album in february um and yeah that's kind of it in a nutshell it's, it's so i mean it's like a a year-long process 
from like writing the songs to when it's released, but it, it took so many people to make it happen. Did you um, film the, the footage at, at your church at the main campus? Yeah. Yeah. So it was at the Lake Forest campus, which is the original campus. Um, and we just invited all of our campuses to be part of it. So you had like can't all the campuses production um, people, volunteers coming together to, to help with the, the stage setup, the, the camera set up, all the things. We had worship leaders from all campuses be part of the night, serving on platform, serving off platform. It was really a cool, like all church, like opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was thinking, cause the last time I've been to Saddleback, like, I mean, I swear the, the entire stage was like, like half of them had played with Michael Jackson. Sheila E was like on, <laughs> you know, Abe Laboreal Jr. was on a big, <laughs> I was just like, what is what kind of worship time is this, you know? And so, like, <laughs> how can you even with that many like heavy hitter musicians and creatives, like, how do you even like most churches are just dying for people? And I feel like you guys, it's like, how do you even decide who is getting gonna participate? You know? I would say like Saddleback has taken very, very many forms of like different seasons of Saddleback and what the the thing I've always said is like what we have now what we do is stands on the foundation and the shoulders of the legends who have come before so like I remember like Rick Machow used to be the worship pastor he yeah. transitioned out John Cassetto came in and Rick Machow stayed such a solid mentor and friend to Saddleback and was so gracious with the new wave of worship leaders coming in and there was a day at Saddleback where like you said those type of musicians were on every weekend and it's I think we just find ourselves in a different season of 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 different volunteers different people who are just coming in to try to build the church mm -hmm. um we have 20 campuses and there's a lot of different sizes I mean Lake Forest is our biggest campus, but we have lots of set up tear down campuses mm -hmm. where you just have people with normal nine to five jobs coming in and volunteering their Sunday to play guitar. And that that's just how they serve the church. And so it's taken di different shapes and yeah, and it, vibes along the it definitely It definitely looks different. And it's been a sweet season. Yeah. I remember coming, uh, I came to Saddleback right during COVID, and I remember Pastor John talking about this new value of empowering volunteers. It's our volunteers who build the church. It's our volunteers who are ministers. And back then, because we were coming out of COVID, it felt very overwhelming because everyone was scared of the virus and, you know, churches were starting to open again and a lot of churches lost people, you know, all, all these kind of variables. But everyone stacked hands on that and we've seen such beautiful fruit of just volunteers again, like you said, that have nine to fives, but on the weekends they just give it all to the church and to the Lord with their gifts. It's been really yeah. cool, really cool. Yeah. Talk about like like for instance, like Ryan has left California and moved to Nashville, right? And like half the people that I uh, do gigs with have moved from California to Nashville. What, what is like the, the atmosphere in California? Because there's kind of like a stigma that there's like a hiatus from people leaving California. Right. Um, but like I have a bunch of family there and I know for a fact that there's, you know, Christianity is live and alive and well there, but like, how do you navigate that, you know, that like transitional period that it seems like the whole country's in yeah i mean there's probably a lot of layers to it i i love nashville i was just there last week and it's just such a beautiful place people creatives i think some of the beautiful parts of nashville is like you're around people who do what you do and there's a camaraderie around being around like-minded people um i mean it's expensive in california <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say that. I think, I think though, it. I think for me and the friends that I've known that have moved out, I think it always has to come down to calling. 
like where is the intersection of calling and assignment like ca god called you to do something but your assignment is where god called you to do it and i think i think the people i've known the assignment changed and given all of the variables of their situation their assignment became nashville but i'm just of the belief that the lord wants a there needs to be a great awakening in both locations mm -hmm. Nashville and California for, for different reasons. I mean, I think every, every culture, every state, every County needs to be awakened in some way. And I think for us here in California, we just feel like our assignment is to be the hands and feet of Jesus and yeah. saying, you want to do another great awakening on this earth. And we believe that you're going to do it here in California. We believe mm -hmm. that you're sending something fresh and new here and the same for our friends in Nashville. God wants to do something extraordinary in Nashville and the people that are there, God's going to do it through them. God's going to equip them um, to be the hands and feet for that as well. Hmm. Yeah. Sorry, Ryan, you... didn't throw you under the bus. <laughs> well, it's, it's a tangible step. There's, I mean, I, well, I mean, I think there's a, there's an individual, I mean, from as being, being one of those refugees or whatever, I mean, there's a, there's a story behind every one of them where God, I mean, yeah, there's a calling, sure, a calling that the Lord uses. But, um, I mean, as I'm, yeah. I'm hearing everything you're talking about and it's still just kind of reeling thinking about like, well, how on earth do you manage so many campuses all the time? I mean, and it does come down to treating your volunteers right and well, and not even just treating them well and like bringing them donuts and all like we can do all that, but spiritually yeah. fostering what they're doing and yeah. helping them come to their calling. Could you maybe give us some tangible stuff? Because obviously you're doing something right to be able to even field a team like that. You know, someone's listening saying, I don't even have a drummer this weekend. Like what are what on earth are you guys <laughs> totally. doing? Like what, what are you doing to get so much engagement out of them? How are you empowering them? Just give us a little glimpse into your volunteer yeah. discipleship process, I guess. Well, I definitely want Jario to speak on this because so Jario was part of uh, one of our regional campuses and now he's at Lake Forest, which is our original campus. If you want to call it like the flagship campus, it's where things are broadcasted from. I think one of the m most fundamental things, and this is from top down communicated from John, is the passage, let love be your highest goal. And what we mean by that is there's got to be this bedrock and foundation of love and uh, respect towards each other in the sense that how we communicate, uh, how we train volunteers, if things are feeling weird from camp, we call it central, which is like the team that helps support 20 campuses. If things aren't feeling right, regional campus leads need to have the freedom to call me up or call someone else up from central and saying, Hey, that email didn't feel good. Like the way you said that. And then the way that it was resourced, it didn't feel great. And I, on central, I need to have the posture of say, of saying, okay, I, re I respect that. That's great feedback. I'm going to try to do better next time. The way we communicate to each other, the way we love and respect one another, because we can get into systems and processes. It's always going to be different for every church. Like we try to resource all of our campuses with, you know, with charts, tracks, uh, band, vocal, ISOs. We try to make that as clean and, and great as possible on planning center. But at the bedrock, we have to have a culture of love. Yeah. We have to be able to say, hey, I didn't hit that the way I wanted to, I'm going to do better next time. And recently with new leadership, we've talked a lot about a culture of feedback. Like we not only want to say, yeah, well, you can give feedback. We like want to, well, we want to like champion it and say, we need to have consistent feedback because if it's not working for campuses, the way we resource, the way we develop, the way we pastor people, then it, if it's not working, then it's not working. We need to change it. We yeah. need to dial it in. Yeah. What is your, like, you have a good perspective because you were at a campus. Yeah. Yeah. I loved, I I still love my people. I, I It's very recent that I moved. Um, but I remember coming um, into Irvine South, like I said, it was all online. And I got a list of like 30 volunteers. And I remember within 30 days, I had 
like 30 coffees with people, you know, with my with whoever was down or Zooms for the people that wanted to do Zooms. Um, and then, you know, from from that into starting in-person services again and getting to know them in person, getting to know them, how they served and seeing some of my volunteers because they were moving out of state and, yeah. you know, the struggle of having to use the same volunteer over and over again because we're short on a drummer or a, but from that always focused on building relationships so i would you know once i once i noticed um natural groups of people you know how you know they they make friends or there's inclinations on this group and then in this group i started identifying those and just having them over for dinner at my house and just having you know relationship with them so it was like deeply relational and deeply developmental i would do 30 minute singing lessons on zoom with whoever was interested and just we're gonna go over this song that i want you to lead and i'm I'm gonna get you there um and from that just like making personal asks on the weekend in the patio and um doing vocal workshops on tuesday nights and starting a choir and you know doing band workshops and from there i feel like got put in my heart you gotta you you need leaders you need to develop these people to become leaders so all of one step after the other i feel like it was all about building from the bottom and for them to take the ministry into their own hands and i mm. think that's effective when what is it you you buy into what you i, I can't remember the phrase but it's when you have something that you can contribute to yeah that makes you excited yeah, buy in there yeah and yeah. i think just to just to be honest too like you don't have to have 20 campuses to to have the struggle of like at the end of the day we're creatives so we're not always the best in things like admin and organization <laughs> like clicking confirm I'll be the on first planning center i'm terrible <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm terrible at it but like i think as long as you have the posture of a servant like I want to do the best I can to make sure communication is is done as best as possible so that production volunteers, everyone is getting good communication. Because mm -hmm. I think in our space between worship, production, leadership, good communication might be one of the best ways to showcase your love for each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether that's like cleaning up your processes and your documents and how how far out you think about things on planning center and flow and program like if you can communicate effectively that might be one of the best ways you yeah. you showcase your love for you and other. when you do that when you create um a good record of good communication and being responsible and organized when something comes up and you have to throw a curveball to one of your volunteers they'll take it like nothing because they're used to you being a good steward of what the lord's given you yeah. and the leadership that you have in your hands yeah that's good from the, um, oh, go ahead. I guess it, go ahead, Ryan. I say, like from, from your perspective, I'm kind of moving to the volunteer side. I'd love to hear what do you look for when you're identifying people? Like you're going to start a choir. So that takes a lot of people. Are you inviting anybody and everybody and letting it kind of sift itself out? Like what, what is it that like draws you to somebody? I mean, this is coming from even from like the volunteer worship leader or somebody at the church. It's like, I want to get involved in worship ministry. What what would you look for in them? Like what what should they be working for if they want to get involved in their church? I think different seasons call for different strategies, and you know if you're in a season where you re really need, I feel like you're probably gonna lower your standards a little bit. But there's always you know you let's say we always do auditions before we onboard anyone um, in our teams, and you know when they you got if it's a vocalist you gotta you got to see that they can sing in tune even even if they have a little bit of pitch problems that they have an ear for music you know and maybe you identify can they sing a harmony or can they not Cause can this musician get through a whole song without stumbling and if they stumble how bad was it can they get you know get them uh, themselves back up um so i also think it will depend on how much work you're willing to put Right. Or how much capacity you you have to work on them. Because if you're in a season where this is all you have and your only goal is to develop the people, yeah. then you can, you know, give yourself room for a bit to be more flexible. Yeah. One of the things we talked about at a 
a worship summit a few years ago. We do this worship summit for all of our worship staff at our campuses. We get away for three days and pray and figure out what the vision is for the new year. One of the things we talked about one year was identifying for in our teams the the crawl, walk, run like method. Like in our team, who's crawling? So you're super beginners. Who's walking that intermediate musician, singer, you know, they can get through a song. It's bumpy at times, but they, they're pretty solid. And then our run, who's running, who are the, like, they're super ahead of the pack. And how do we invite the people who are running to help those who are crawling? That's really good. Yeah. So like, how are we duplicate, like multiplying ourselves? Cause I think about like, I grew up in a church of 70 people <laughs> growing up Yeah. And I'm a small church guy. Like I, that's, that's just who I am. And I, when I was leading worship in a church that size, I, I didn't have a staff with me. Like it was me and, um, I was in college, so I wasn't really, I wasn't getting paid either. So I was like, who on my team can I trust to develop the other people on the team? Like, how can I multiply myself so that because you can't do it all yourself. And that's yeah. kind of our culture as staff is we can't do it all ourselves. If we will burn out and we won't be effective. So who are the core people on our team that are super solid? That's good. They're great musicians. They have great hearts. And how are we asking them to help develop those that are crawling? Yeah. Um, and Jario, Jario did it, man, he was so good at it because there wasn't a week that went by where he didn't have people at his house investing in them and empowering them to lead the ministry because we that's been a a thing for saddleback is empower the volunteers to lead the ministry we're as staff we're ad ministers so we are administrating so that the volunteers carry the mantle of of leadership um of of leading the ministry and we're just helping them uh grow into their full potential as ministers yeah reach it love it <laughs> Going back to the album, um, obviously you guys have tested these songs on your church. Like if, say, a church wants, you know, they want one song from the album and they, they don't want to like go through, try every single one of them. What would be like the one song yeah. that you'd like, hey, this could be really awesome at your church? I think, I think it's Christ Forever. I think there's there's like a handful of songs that man I would be so stoked if the if it was on the lips of the Capital C Church, but I think Christ Forever. I don't hear a lot of surrender songs. Like there there are out there, and there's some good ones. I, I there's there's good surrender songs, but like anytime we can give fresh language around um, a posture of like a posture like surrender. Um, I think of acts and him, we live and move and have our being like yeah. anytime we can put fresh melody and lyrics around that scriptural truth. I think it's always a win for the church. I'd probably say Christ forever. Definitely. Yeah. It's also very, it feels very corporate, very easy to sing, very easy to follow, very easy to learn. Yeah. So that's the one with Mitch Wong on it, right? Yeah. How did you yeah, um, get he's... connected? Yeah. So we, uh, we were in town and we were able to set up a right with him. And I would say, I would say he's, I could go on and on about Mitch. I think he's just a wonderful person. But one of the things I love about Mitch is there's a purity to, to just who he is in Christ. And it felt like we just started talking and I immediately felt like we had been brothers mm -hmm. for years. Like he has that, that gift of, kind of like Paul, he could kind of go into any environment and just build a relationship with people. And I think being able to carry that song with him was such a joy to like, there's something on Mitch's life that is just beautiful and it's radiant. And he, you know that he knows the Lord and, and carries something special. And with that song in particular, it was with Mitch, Kyle, Lee, and uh, Tim Riabajan, who used to be on staff and is now in Nashville. Um, but it really felt like God was just downloaded that, that song for our church for such a time as this. Yeah. And 
it just, it was totally God because God knew that Mitch needed to carry that song with us. And I always feel like that's a capital C church opportunity when, mm -hmm. you know, Mitch is not a member of Saddleback, but he carried that song with us. Mm -hmm. And it was an opportunity to say, Hey, it's not about one church. It's not about the name on the building. It's about Jesus. Amen. And that was an opportunity to, to carry that song together. Um, it was really special. Really, really sweet. What was the hardest part about making this new album? Whoa. <laughs> How much time do you have? I'm just kidding. Uh I always think I always think the song selection and leadership, like who's leading the songs is the hardest part. It's my it's easily my least favorite part because there's an army of songwriters at Saddleback that are submitting great songs. And honestly, it's, it's, I feel bad saying it, but there's just a lot of great worship leaders in our house that it's impossible to have every one of them on the album. And I know a lot of churches, that's a hard thing for them. But I think that was the hardest part is like saying like, are, are these the right songs? Like mm. there's a few others that didn't make it that we really love too, but it just didn't fit the, it didn't fit where the package of songs, what the, what the package of songs needed to be. Um, it's long hours, like editing and production. I'm sure if we got Mikey on the podcast, he would probably have a different answer, but I think song selection and, and singers was probably the hardest. Yeah. But I also think, uh, one interesting fact is that we recorded um the English and the Spanish oh, yes. back to back. I totally forgot. So we recorded English <laughs> on a Tuesday night and Spanish on the on the Wednesday night. So we had oh, wow. to, the room had to turn around and, and yeah, we did the, it in the same room. Yeah. Or the other way around. Spanish. It was in the Spanish way, yeah. Tuesday night and then English Wednesday night, both live captures. <laughs> and yeah, that was my fault. I will never do that again. <laughs> no, I'll own that one. Um, but you know, it it that was a crazy week. It was a crazy because you had yeah. rehearsals, pre production. You had two capture nights back to back. Two teams. Two teams. Some people overlapping. Oh, jar. So scheduling was really yeah. I think scheduling you're, was also you're bringing it all back. <laughs> you're bringing it. You're bringing it all back. No, it was different. Yeah, players. that might be the. <laughs> Say that again. It was just different players, complete like the whole team was different. Yeah, different band. Wow. Some of the vocalists, some of the vocalists crossed over because we have God has just blessed us with a rich Spanish speaking community of just beautiful people who songwriters, artists that lead bilingual. And we have um like three venues where it's it's Spanish speaking services. So there was like two or three that did both, and Jario is one of them. Jario is on both albums, um, so he probably felt it in a different way <laughs> for sure. Uh, but yeah, two different, two different producers for the night, like a live producer for Flow, two different bands, two different vocal teams with a few crossing over. Production team did both. Um, we also had project managers for the two different albums kind of spread a little, but it was a lot. It was a lot, yeah. I don't think we'll ever do that again. Yeah, it was a lot, but yeah. it was fun. Yeah. We got it done. <laughs> I've always wondered, like, when you do, like, a whole, uh, like, a duplicated album in Spanish and you're translating it, how much, like, word crafting do you have to do? Like, because obviously, do you, are you focused more on, like, being true to the original lyrics or are you focused on, like, phrasing, cadence and like rhyme scheme like how do you how do you do that um yeah best. i've i've yeah i've had the privilege of doing some translations and it's always fun uh, the answer is both so you fight for both until you have to give up and choose one so if you know there's there's some there's some songs that just comes very naturally and it's very easy to do both but then if that's not the case you ask yourself what is what are these two lines trying to say and how do we make it happen in spanish that 
Um, maybe it's not exactly the same, but it still says the same message. It doesn't necessarily need to be word by word, but just yeah. a song with I think we try to um stay true to the melodies and stay true to the overall message of each verse or each, you know, if you can do it line by line, but if not every, every two lines or you know. Yeah. But yeah. this wasn't a duplicate. No, so yeah, that's the cool thing is on the Spanish album. Christ Forever was translated into Spanish and that's on the album, but the other seven songs on the Spanish record were written in Spanish. So we've we've had we've had different songs over the years be translated and Jariel has been part of that. Um, Andres, people from our Buenos Aires campus, volunteers who love to translate. We've translated songs throughout the years, but this project, the reason why it was so special is because it was all written in Spanish besides that one song, Christ Forever. Um, so yeah, it was, yeah. I can't wait for that to get really released. Cool. Are you saying that the, the, the songs on Christ Forever, the English version, were originally written in Spanish? And no, I'm saying for this for the Spanish album, those songs were written in Spanish rather than oh, so different taking song. different songs. Got it. The, Got on, it. the only song that was first in English and then translated to Spanish was Christ Forever. Got but it. the other seven songs on the Spanish album were, were written and produced for that project. For that project, yeah. Okay. That that seemed a little less complicated than doing the whole album exactly <laughs> Spanish. Like, it's I mean it still seems hard, but man, that's crazy. So when is the when is that album release? I believe that's I think we're still sorting that out. I think it's late summer. Late okay. summer, early fall. And I mean, there's one song on that Spanish album that we wanna we wanna translate it to English. Like it's it's really cool. I mean, it's just it's just who's on our team and who's in our mm -hmm. church. We're we're just trying to be obedient to yeah who God's blessed us with. We're and leaders. even you know even though Christ Forever the album was not translated fully into Spanish, we have translated most yeah. songs because our Spanish speaking campuses want to sing these songs. So we you know put on the work and yeah. translate it. So they are they are being sung in Spanish, which is really cool as well. Are you guys going to tour this album at all? That's not the plan. I mean, I think I think our commission just currently is is I mean, a lot of us are all of us are neck deep in the ministry like the day-to-day -day ministry of empowering yeah. developing volunteers. And we're just our current season is we just we're serving this house mm -hmm. and we're building this church and but yeah, not not currently. That's not our goal or our, our mission. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Cause like, I know, I mean, a lot of like, like elevation, for instance, like they, they make an album and then yeah. they tour that, you know? So that's, that's interesting concept that, so your album was kind of for your church is what you're saying for the, for the church. But I, what I've loved about what I've, what I, and we lead a lot of elevation songs. We are mm. huge. We love their songs. We love, we love their song so much. Currently, I think it is first and foremost for our church, but with how, with technology now, social media, CCLI, like any church can lead these songs and they have access to these songs. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're not putting any restrictions on what the Holy Spirit might do in the capital C church with these yeah. songs. Yeah. But I think for our day to day, like what we're setting our hands to, yeah, we're just building our church currently. Super cool. Um, I would love to hear you. You you kind of briefly mentioned because um, the last time I was at Saddleback, uh, Pastor Rick Warren was the pastor, and Rick Muchow was still there with us. Yeah. And, um. Uh, you said that they did a great job of like, kind of handing over the reins, and you know a lot of our listeners and subscribers talk about like having really hard transitions of leadership. And so yeah. like, could you just talk about what a healthy transition looks like? Yeah. I, I will say like, so I've been on staff 10 years and 
I've been very fortunate to, to be in a, in a healthy church, healthy environment. And my dad was a pastor when he was still alive. He was senior pastor at my home church. And I've just always been blessed with healthy leaders above me. Um, but I think I always come back to the church is still made up of people. And mm -hmm. anytime there are people involved, there's going to be imperfection. There's going to be problems and dysfunction to some level. And it, I'm not going to say it's been perfect because there have been moments where it feels a bit bumpy. We're trying to get our bearings. We're trying to go in a new direction. But what what's healthy about it is an open line of communication. Um, and, and this realization of being honest, Hey, we're probably not going to fully figure this out for a couple of years <laughs> and just being as a staff being honest, like there's some growing pains with transition there. Yeah. There are new people coming into roles they've never been in. There are people who have been here a long time that are focusing on different things. And so I think it's grace and I think grace from the top down, like having grace for transition. Yeah. 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 And it's also, it's also been, it's, it is a huge transition. Yeah. It's nothing small. <laughs> it's like one of the biggest churches, you yeah. know, and like Pastor Rick was here for 40 plus years. Yeah. And I loved it because he was announcing his leave for a long time. Yeah. You know, he's, he's got you guys. I'm going soon. I'm not <laughs> gone because I haven't found the one God's ha yeah. God hasn't told me, Yeah, you know, and he was, I think he was preparing. And I remember when, when, um, pastor Andy, um, said yes to the calling to come to Saddleback. Um, we had a, probably a whole month celebrating oh, pastor yeah. Rick. Obviously totally. every service we had a different element. One service we had stickers and the oh, other one we had big, yeah. Pa giant <laughs> pastor Rick's and, you know, so I feel like he, 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 walked us through all of it very gracefully very in a in a very funny celebratory way but that was helpful i think yeah and and kind of what we were saying earlier when andy said it's always been about jesus and it always will be about jesus it's never been about mm -hmm. a lead pastor or a structure or it's always been about what jesus can do through his church and i think not to over spiritualize it but i think what's helped at saddleback is if it gets if if it gets hard, it's just, we always just remember who we're doing it for, and like we're doing it under the banner of Jesus. Um, and I will say it's been it's it's been healthy. Mm -hmm. It's been God honoring, and I'm proud of that as yeah. a, as a staff member of Saddleback. It's been a healthy transition, not perfect, but I'm reminded of of who's the leader. Jesus is the yeah. leader of this church. He's the banner that we're under. And so open communication, grace for everyone uh, and remembering why we're in ministry to begin with. Yeah. And I think, um, in the midst of the bumpiness and maybe there's sometimes what you, you know, you're like, what's, you know, what's going to happen next? We don't, we don't know exactly. I feel like the Lord's dropped in us a deeper, dependence on yeah, him and on prayer yeah. and on the spirit and so good again i feel uh, you said it at the beginning um josh how we can do so much we're skilled we are trained we've studied yeah but nothing 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 yeah will be more effective than a prayerful church and a prayerful team yeah. a team that depends on the holy spirit and i think this season has brought yeah. that you're right on our staff That's which good. has been really cool thank you so much for being a part of this week's episode as always if you head over to instagram shoot us a dm we have some really really cool stuff that we want to send your way if you happen to be watching this on youtube too you can go ahead and uh hit that like and subscribe and all that that's what we say on youtube right anyway we're happy to be here for you we want to be an encouragement for you and we have some amazing stuff for you so make sure you shoot us a dm see ya